Spin. Uh, we thank ThoughtWorks for hosting all but one of our events this season. We'd also like to thank the following sponsors, CooperPresents.com, Pearson Education, O'Reilly Media, Our Back Publications. Please visit the sponsor page of nyspin.org for information about all of our sponsors and the membership section for information about becoming a member and getting extra benefits. We'd also like to thank the New York chapter of the Internet Society for sponsoring videos. If you're a member of PMI, they consider us to be a Category B continuing education provider by being here. You earn one PDU. Andrew Stellman and Jennifer Green are making their fourth appearance at NY SPIN. That puts them in second place on the list of the key presenters. They share that second place, though, with Howard Rubin and Ed Jordan. Not that. <laughs> I'm sure you've all had a chance to uh, read their bios, so I'll just cut to the chase and say, ladies and gentlemen, Andrew and Jennifer. So. So this is. Um, so this is a. Uh, we have a new talk for us. It's called Agile Anti-Patterns. What does better than not doing it mean for Agile teams? Um, and I speak louder. I'll do my best. Um, encourage people to let us know if we want to. We're not speaking loud enough. Basically, um, I'm going to read stuff on here in case you can't read it. So I'm just going to read what's on our little slide here. Practices are more or less effective depending on the team's mindset. We've got a pro project manager who says, let's hold a daily stand-up meeting so I can get status from you every day. That's a great practice we can all get behind. Um, he's referring to a daily stand-up. That's probably the most common practice that you'll see on Agile teams. Um, and a lot of people do it. And so he's going to be really surprised because a developer says, we already have too many meetings. If you don't trust me to do my job, find, them, find someone else to do it. The developer was in a bad mood. Yeah. Um, one thing, please interrupt us like any old time. If you if you something strikes your fancy and you want to interject, go ahead. We're we're fine with that. Um, so so let's give a little it's a little background here. First of all, um, we've been introducing ourselves a little bit to people. I'm Andrew Stellman. That's Jennifer Green. Uh, we've been writing books together for O'Reilly since the 2004, 2005, something like that. Um, Learning Agile is our fifth. fifth book, or ninth if you count second and third editions, which we do because they're a lot of work. Um, <laughs> and we, um, we've written books about project management, about programming. We build software. Um, while we do consulting and we do training, Mainly what we do every day is build software with teams. Like we actually work on software teams or manage software teams every day. And that's what we do for a living and write books. Um, and we've been spending a lot of the last 15 plus years really trying to figure out what makes software teams, <coughs> what makes some teams more effective and some teams less effective, um, which really applies well to the agile world. You know, some agile teams seem to be really effective and some seem to have a lot of trouble with exactly the same practices. Before we started this talk, there were a few folks in the audience who mentioned that they had kind of run into these practices where, where people had kind of come in with a good idea, a good practice that had worked at other places, but for whatever reason, it didn't have quite the same impact when, when it was uh, introduced at, on the teams that they were on. That's exactly what we're talking about here. So with, when this developer hears that uh, it's time to go to a stand-up meeting and takes sort of offense at it, saying, I, I go to too many meetings and I don't have time for this, um, at, the project manager doesn't necessarily kind of understand why that's happening or, or why the, uh, the practice itself doesn't appeal to everyone the same way it does to him. So we got the little thought bubbles. The project manager's thinking, I only find out about a problem when it's too late for me to do something about it. Absolutely valid. Developers thinking, when you keep dragging me to meetings, 
I don't have time to write code. That's also valid. I, I come from a development background, and I can tell you there have been many, many times, including earlier today, that I have had that thought. And, um, but as you know, putting on my project manager hat, I hate being blindsided by stuff. Especially stuff that if you just told me about it a little bit earlier, everybody's life would have been easier. I could have done something about this because I actually do something here. So because the project manager is focusing on the, the benefit that they're going to get out of the practice, and we're talking about the daily stand-up practice here, um, and the developer is thinking about what they're going to get out of the practice or not get out of the practice in, in his case, they end up kind of not being able to use the daily stand-up to its best sort of uh, potential. Yeah, for those of you who haven't worked in a team that uses daily stand-ups, um, basically this is a meeting, generally short, generally 15 minutes or so. Everybody stands because nobody likes standing through long meetings, so it kind of encourages everybody to keep the meeting short. Um, and generally during it, everybody kind of gives an update. This is what I've been doing, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, and and you're encouraged to not go off on long tangents. You're encouraged to take things offline. If you, it's a place for raising issues but not exploring issues. And it's meant to be sort of a short daily meeting that everybody syncs, syncs up. Um, so I'm going to read these little blurbs there. The project manager uses a daily stand-up to get status on his plan and give team members their next assignments. The developer wants to get back to coding, so he gives his update and spends the rest of the meeting looking at his phone. Um, which is something I've seen many times in many daily stand-ups. Now, here's the, this is a really, really important part here. The meeting is not nearly as effective as it could be, but it's still worth doing. And that's what we call the team got better than not doing it results. And we hyphenate that, better than not doing it results. Um, and the idea here is that this is not the optimal mindset. It's not the optimal approach to a daily stand-up. And the point we're trying to make is that there is a, the attitude that people have makes a big difference in the practices that they, that, that, they, that they perform. If you come to a practice thinking, I'm going to get this out of it, but not thinking about everything that the practice brings, you can end up with better than not doing it results. Because you're only the, the best you're going to get out of that practice is your goal for it, right? I mean, what you're aiming for. If all a project manager wants is status updates, then it's really going to be a status meeting that's 15 minutes long. Right? Which is still better than most status meetings, which are like three hours long. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the developer, as much as he really wants to sit there looking at his phone, it only kills 15 minutes of his day. And it's better than three hours of looking at his phone. And he still gave an update. He still kept connected with his team. He still occasionally hears something that somebody else says that's worth hearing. And it's generally keeping his project from going too far off the rails without anybody knowing it. And that's, that's a lot to expect from a 15-minute meeting. So uh, out of everybody here who's kind of encountered Agile in the past, how many stand-up meetings have you been in that, that how many of you have been in stand-up meetings that feel that way, where it's kind of more like a status meeting, but yeah, but you're calling it a stand-up because you're either standing up or you're <coughs> keeping it short. Yeah? Yep, I'm getting, seeing some hands there. That's, yeah, okay. that's the way it's, so. When team members understand the principles behind this daily stand-up practice, they get more out of doing it. Because it turns out that this meeting can actually be good. I mean, it's really good for everybody, not just for giving status updates, um, but really good for everyone. So what if the developer and project manager had a different mindset, like a different attitude towards this, towards this practice? Um, like, what if the project manager doesn't think of it as his plan, he thinks of the pl as a plan that everyone on the team worked together to create. And what if the developer does more than just give status? He has and he shares opinions on the whole project. The daily stand-up becomes important to him. And we've got the developer saying, so the daily stand-up means you'll listen to me and actually change the way the project runs? It was kind of a, a, an epiphany, I guess, at one point when we were first encountering Scrum, when Andrew uh, and I realized that stand-up meetings are inspections of, of the plan. That it's, it's kind of like an old-timey inspection meeting that you're having every day with the entire team to see how valid the plan you made is and making changes to it. Yeah. That's, are you 
talking about a strong meeting with five or six team members, or you're yep. talking about 20, 20 different, you know, 20 different teams together? We're talking about five or six team members oh. sitting around <coughs> saying what happened for the day. Yeah. And the team member consists of the product owner, the scrum master, and the developers, right? Well, if it's a scrum project, yes. The, pro the scrum I'm master and the product it. owner definitely need to be in their daily scrum meeting. Yeah, that's right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how this applies to Scrum because there's a lot of, um, it turns out that like a lot of teams that go agile don't necessarily look like a Scrum team, um, but far and away the most common practice that you'll see on agile teams is a daily stand-up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a survey version one does, uh, the annual state of agile survey, and they, one of the questions they ask is like, what practices do you use? And, and topping list every time is this daily stand-up. It's like the easiest thing to implement, and almost everybody does it, and whether they're XP or Scrum or whatever flavor of Agile they, they attempt to put in place. But I want to get back to, like, because there's a really kind of an important point we're trying to make here. You can have the stand-up meeting where you get what we're calling better than not doing it results, where everybody goes in, says their status, looks at their phone, the project manager is like, OK, thanks for your status updates. I've put this plan together, here's your next assignment, here's your next assignment, here's your next assignment, here's your next assignment. And if they do that, it'll still be better than not doing it. It's still worth doing. But if everybody on the team actually feels some real ownership of the plan, where the project manager doesn't create the plan himself, but actually everybody worked together to create a plan they think will actually accomplish what they think needs to be accomplished, and they're daily making changes to it and seeing how valid it is together. It's a much different mindset than someone's responsible for the plan. I don't have to think about it. I'm just going and telling them what I did today. Or this is my plan and I'm giving you assignments and I don't really want to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah. You know, I. Yeah. Yeah. The person who's going to be responsible for the product. Mm -hmm. That person's supposed to know what is needed in the marketplace and what's needed. So if you get a developer's point of view about <coughs> changing things, or the DA's point of view about changing things, you might go into a different direction that might not be what the product owner wants. So let me put that on hold a little bit, because we're going to talk a lot about Scrum, and product owner really comes in place there. But let me flip it on the other end. What if the product owner says, these are the things that are really, really valuable to me, to my customers, to our customers. And the developers and the business analysts say, OK, but these two or three things that you say are the most valuable are really, really hard, possibly impossible. And the next two or three things are much, much easier. If the product, if the product owner doesn't listen to them, they're going to spend a lot of time build, building something that without delivering a lot of value. But if he does listen to them, Maybe they can still deliver, deliver less valuable things, but deliver them more quickly, and that might be strategic. That only happens if the product owner <coughs> comes the project with a mindset of actually listening to the team. And well, in addition to listening to the team, is what, what is the strategic um, drive? What the what, senior management do? Because it's all driven from there. And can he get the team, can he or she, the product owner, get the team to actually care about those things? We're going to talk about that with Scrum too. You had something? Yeah, I wanted to get back to the kind of developer project management mindset. Um, so we've implemented Scrum. We do the daily stand-ups, and you know, from a product owner uh, standpoint, he's saying, "Well, these are the thing. These are the user stories that are valuable for this sprint." Um, yeah, and as Scrum goes, we, the developers sort it amongst themselves who looked at what, right? Mm -hmm. However, we've run into this issue where the mindset of the developers are still like, well, you know, you're the product owner, assign me the task that you want. So how, how would you address that? Well, that's interesting. You know, it's funny, when you first encounter, um, and actually that's a pretty good lead into our next, to our next slide. You know, when you first encounter a lot of these, these ideas, especially in Scrum, um, sometimes, um, you know, our pie in the sky thought is, hey, we're empowering the team. We're telling, we're telling the, we're telling the programmers, you can be part of this. You can actually have opinions on the plan. Because that's always bothered me. Like I always had strong opinions on how projects should be run. Um, and what we found after talking to probably hundreds of people, team members over the years, is exactly what you described. A lot of people just want to be told, 
give me, give me something to do, um, which is really, really comfortable. We actually spent a lot of time in our book talking about this. Um, it's this idea of a CYA attitude, um, where it's a very comfortable place to be, to have somebody else who's come up with a plan, who, if something goes wrong, if your project is late, if, you know, stuff hits the fan, um, you can say, well, I didn't come up with this plan. He did. I'm just doing what I told. And everything, I look at all the things that ticked off my list. Um, and it's, you know, how do you get a team out of that attitude? That's a good question. And one of the things we're going to really talk about over the course of, I guess, the next hour or so, is we're going to really talk about where, what it means for an organization. You pointed this out. It was really smart. Um, that how, how organizations have a culture. And sometimes that culture of the organization really clashes with the culture of what you're asking them to do. And that's, that's really, when you have an organization where making mistakes, for example, can really cost you your job, it's really comfortable to have somebody else telling you what to do. <clears throat> because your job is not line. It's their job. Because if you screwed up, well, I did everything they told me. Look at him. You know, I did everything that was in the spec. Well, the business analyst says, well, I did everything the product, I put everything in the spec the product only told me to do. The product owner says, well, I put everything, I told them to do everything that I got from the users. Everybody can point to somebody else. So when the project, you know, falls, you know, crashes and burns, nobody's job's at stake. Honestly, can you blame them? Yeah, I, I get that, but the, the fact is our culture doesn't, we don't have that kind of culture. You know, we, we're actually encouraged to make mistakes and fail fast. That's the encouragement. That's, pretty That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so how do you get the ad developers? So, so this? Can I repeat that? Oh, yeah. So we've got, he's, he, he's, he's working at one of those, uh, those incredible companies where you actually have a culture where you're allowed to make mistakes, encouraged to fail fast. Um, you know, I know there's, there's laughter from people. So this is how I always run my teams. And so I've, I've seen it, put it in place myself. And I've also encountered many people who, upon hearing that, just laugh. It, it couldn't possibly work that way. So you're in an interesting situation. How do you get developers who don't want that? What they want to do is be told what to do. So we'll talk. Let's um, let's put a pin in that right now and try to get back to it because I think I, I think if you boil this whole talk down, because because. We're going to see a lot of different examples of places where um, there are principles behind what, what's being asked of people, and those principles don't quite make it through. Um, I, I think you could boil all of this down to saying, like, getting people to kind of understand, in principle, why they're being asked to do what they're going to do and how that's going to benefit both their product and their own kind of working lives is the difference between these practices working and them failing. Or these practices working and well them enough, being okay. Yeah, yeah. Versus doing a, really making a huge difference and making your project just so much more productive, pleasant to work on. And that's why I thought this was a good lead-in for this slide. So most team members focus on focus on practices that directly help them do their jobs. And so I've got we've got a developer architect saying unit testing, refactoring, continuous integration, and automated builds are great. They'll definitely help me build better code, because he cares about code. And we got a scrum master who's saying, between our task boards, project velocity, and burn down charts, we'll have way better control of the project. Because a scrum master, this guy is kind of like, he's called a scrum master, but he's a really thinking project manager, and he wants to control the project. And we've got a product owner saying, doing release planning with user stories really lets me explain to the team exactly what the users need. Because a product owner really, as you said, he cares about giving, helping them understand what our users, what we actually deliver, and what we have to because that's what the market wants. And a team lead is saying, daily stand-ups and retrospectives, they'll bring the team together. It'll be great once we're all talking about the project. Because the team lead wants to get their team to be cohesive and productive and, and, and have a really good team environment. And these are all good things. You know, and we've got them all clustered around a task board, which is a mainstay of many Agile projects. Um, so it was, I mean, I thought in the development team, you don't have a leader. It's self-organizing. So how did we come up with a team lead? Well, actually, a team lead is a, is a scrum role. Oh, the scrum. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But the, um, and also, it, you know, even if you've got self-organizing teams, well, first of all, there's a boss, right? Yeah. And someone, someone hires and fires. So if you, you know, if you screw up royally, someone, you're going to go into someone's office and they're going to tell you, 
you know, you do this again, we're going to have to have a talk. So <laughs> the team would... You know, and there's Nate someone as the lead? Well, no. And no, there the normally boss, is a team lead. Generally, yeah. there's going to be a boss, you know, yeah. a team manager or a team lead. Like, this yeah. is, you know, just because we have a self organizing team doesn't mean that you don't have actual project roles. Yeah. There's and, still a hierarchy in the company, right? Even if, even if the team is deciding what tasks it's going to work on individually. You know, and the team lead might be insisting, yes, we are self organizing, but there's still someone with authority. I mean, it's a company. Yeah. And you can't, you can't get away from that, right? I mean, there's, there is no. No matter, the, no matter how flat they say the company hierarchy is, you know, there's still someone at the top of it. And generally, the more they claim, the more they, well, yeah, right. And, and the more they claim, the, and actually, one of the things we found is the more you hear the the, the phrase "flat organization," the deeper the hierarchy is, you know, they come. So that's just our opinion. That's just our opinion. We've seen it proven over and over again. So we've got a picture of an elephant here. It says, when the team gets the principles, they get more out of the practices. And inside this elephant, which took Jenny hours in, 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 in keynote to build, um, and uh, we've got, um, you've got lots of names of practices, time boxing, user stories, retrospective, velocity, uh, burn up charts, burn down charts, information radiators, lots of, and these are all good practices. Why is it an elephant, Andrew? Why is it? That's a good question. <laughs> so for those of you who, for some reason, haven't heard the story of the blind man and the elephant, I'll tell it to you right now. It's a very old story. Um, it's uh, four blind men are encounter an elephant. And they really don't know what to make of it. So one of them grabs its leg and says, oh, it's like a tree. And another one touches its side and says, oh, it's like a wall. And another one grabs its tail and says, oh, it's like a rope. And another one grabs its trunk and says, oh, it's like a snake. Um, and then along comes a king, because there's always a king, and kings are wise. And the king says, you're all right, but the elephant is more than everything you say and more. And because, the, you know, because they can only see the one piece of the elephant that, they're, that they, they came in contact with. And practices are like that, too. Like, like not just practices, but process the whole sort of the whole um, ecosystem that you, that, that, that you work in that gets your projects done. You know, if I'm a developer, I see the development stuff. I see stuff about building code. If I'm a project manager, I see stuff about running projects. And if I'm a team lead, I see stuff about bringing the people together. If I'm a, if I'm a product owner, I see stuff about getting, delivering value, delivering value to our users. And all of these things are good, but to run a project well, everybody needs to care about all of those things. So we go back to the Agile Manifesto, um, and, and I'm sure you've all seen this, but it's, it's worth kind of talking about this in context now that we've, we've kind of given you this whole fractured perspective idea. And that's but, what we call it, by the way. When the developer cares about the developer stuff, and the project manager cares about project manager stuff, and the architect cares about architect stuff, and the team lead cares about team lead stuff, and the project manager, everybody cares about their own stuff. We call that a fractured perspective. Um, because I care about the things I care about and everything else, I don't really, you know, that's really the source of what you're talking about, which is why I thought it was a good lead in. The, the, the team member who's like, just tell me what to do so I can care about just my things. I don't want to look at the big picture. I just want to look at the small microcosm of this project that I can just care about this one little thing, get my hands around this one thing. I'm not going to care about anything else. I'm going to refuse to care about anything else. That's a comfortable place to be. A fractured perspective is a comfortable place to be. Because I know every day all I have to do is care about this stuff and think about this stuff. I don't have to think about anything else. But the whole idea that the Agile Manifesto was, was written to kind of address is, is getting people to think differently than that. Do you want to go a little bit about the, uh, the two minute, what is the Agile Manifesto and where it came from? Does, <laughs> does everyone know what the Agile Manifesto is? Do you want to? You know, let's, let's assume at least one person can use it. Okay, um, the uh, Agile Manifesto, I guess, uh, what was it, 2001? Yeah, in, Snowbird, uh, Utah. Snowbird, Utah. Hey, um, <laughs> a bunch of people. I'm not going to remember Brigham Young. <laughs> a bunch of people got together, um, software developers, um, on a retreat to try to come up with kind of a different way to build software. Um, and they, what they wrote was the Agile Manifesto um, and a series of principles that went with it. Um, which we cover in depth in the book. We're not going to go through that right now because it'll stop us from getting through a lot of other stuff. 
But the manifesto itself, these, these four sentences, um, have a lot to do with kind of the, all of the agile kind of methodologies and schools of thought that have come about ever since. So we're just gonna go through each one of them. We kind of wrote a comment here about how these things are meant to help you bring your perspective together rather than fracturing it. Um, so individuals and interactions over processes and tools. This is about getting everyone on the team talking to their teammates and understanding their perspectives instead of hyper-focusing on one aspect of the project. That's actually what that means. Um, uh, <laughs> customer collaboration over contract negotiation. If people actually think, like they'll see this and think, oh, this is something about consultants. Um, there's an idea that, and this is kind of an important thing, um, and this also gets back to the, the minds that your, your guys are in. When I, um, I've been on a lot of teams where we actually say we've got like an SLA with the rest of the company. Like we're gonna deliver this, it's gonna, you know, this agreement, we're gonna provide this level of service, we're gonna fix bugs within this amount of time, we're going to, you know, we're gonna keep our software up, we're gonna update it, and update it every two weeks or whatever. Um, we literally establish a contract with the rest of the company. Talk a lot of, have a lot of teams where they treat a spec as a contract. This is the contract that we're gonna, we're gonna build everything in the spec and when we build everything in the spec, we're done. And you have user acceptance testing in the end where the user comes in and validates that everything that was written in the spec is, is what you delivered. And that's all like, you know, a contract. Um, like it might not be an official business to business contract, but it's a contract mindset. And if you're collaborating with your customers, sometimes they'll like, you'll, together you'll discover, hey, there's something that we need that isn't in the spec. Maybe we want to change it, maybe we want to throw it out. Maybe we can find a better way the battery's flat. Just let me. Uh, okay. Have that. I'll just. just, I'll just ah, do you want? Do you want to? No, it's okay. fine. I'll just stick a new one in there. Yeah. Incidentally, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show some love to our BYU friends. I didn't mean to snub them for the Utes. It's a sports uh, sports thing. Right? I don't even know what that means. Utah Utah sports teams in universities. Anyway. Um, the, uh, the idea is, like, if you collaborate with it, you know, sometimes you do need that contract negotiation aspect of things. Sometimes your project costs what, but we prefer customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And if you're on a team where you prefer this contract negotiation attitude, where you've got, I want to look at my thing, tell me what to do, I will do it. That I will establish this contract between a project manager and the developers. That's a team that, that's kind of moved away from an Agile mindset and is really gonna have trouble with a lot of the Agile stuff, the practices, the methodologies, the ideas, because, because they prefer contract negotiation over customer, from, uh, customer collaboration. So you're saying that you know, we should just reinforce the principles initially not just initially, but just in throughout. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To and constantly be be bringing it back to why are we doing this? What what does this fit under? You know, what is the actual point of, of, of the practice that we're putting in place? And we'll come back to that. Like, this yeah. is this is a theme for us. So. Yeah. yeah. So the rest of this agile manifesto, you wanna? Yeah, uh, working software over comprehensive documentation. So it's easy for a hyper focused team to lose track of what the users actually need. This makes sure that users' perspectives and ideas are genuinely represented. And that, you know, because you're constantly demonstrating the software to the end users and their understanding because they're seeing and clicking on it that, you know, what it is that you're building. And people get hung up on this idea of comprehensive documentation. And I definitely have encountered a lot of times um, the idea that you want to document a lot of stuff just sort of for posterity. You know, as long as we document it, it's going to get done or it's going to, you know, put in a plan, put in a spec, put in a, in a user manual or something. Whatever it is, the project starts with a pile of documentation. Um, I've been guilty of that myself. Um, and it's not that document documentation is bad, it's just that working software is more valuable. Um, Weber, who gave a lecture one time in the annual Agile meeting, he said the best way to handle documentation would have a separate sprint just for the documentation. I don't know if it's a. I mean, under certain teams, that works great. The idea that, that, that uh, the idea of the best way to handle documentation might be to have a separate sprint for it, like have a separate iteration for it. I I'm s skeptical that'll work that well, only because um, what's the rest of your team doing during that iteration? Um, 
And once you start talking about, so that half the team is working on one thing while half the team is working on another, you're not really working as a team anymore. So, so can we get a definition of what documentation you're referring to in this? Well, <laughs> so, so that's a good question. And honestly, it, it's, it varies from project to project to team to team. You know, um, some teams do just fine with nothing but user stories written on index cards. Other teams really work really well with a decent, decently fleshed out spec. You know, some projects have like regulatory <laughs> concerns and stuff to, to make sure that you I mean you have to have a certain level of documentation. You know, it's it's part of the part of the product that you're building. I, I spent years managing a team of business analysts, and we produced a lot of documentation, and it was good, and it made our projects work really well. Now, here's the thing about documentation, and I think this is what, what gets the, the core of it. Anytime I'm training my teams on how to write documentation or writing specifications or user stories or whatever, um, use cases, any kind of documentation, I always point out that what's on this piece of paper is not really important. What's on what's important is what's in your head matches what's in my head matches what's in her head. And we're all thinking the same thing. Yeah, but what comes out to you guys? I mean, you guys are gone, so then it has to figure out what you did. And then yeah. documentation. But that's but right. It's You're right. Well, well, You're right. Absolutely. absolutely right. And that's, that's why it's working so far over comprehensive documentation, not instead of comprehensive documentation. Because that is important. But it's not as important as delivering <coughs> the software that meets the user's needs and delivers value today. Because I think what they're saying is don't let the cart get before the horse, right? Don't get so focused on writing documentation about the software that you're building that you don't build the software. Or that you, that you make everyone kind of you know, spend a lot of time reviewing documents before you'll write one piece of code. Because a lot of times, people don't know what they want until they see it. And so by, by having a product that you're kind of constantly getting feedback on, then the documentation becomes a, a more valuable piece of it. And, and be realistic about how it's going to be used, because there's a lot of times when if we spent weeks working on a document that realistically isn't ever going to be used again, and instead of spending weeks working on that document, we could have spent a few hours talking about it, and then a few more hours over the course of the project talking to the team, that might have been a better use of time. He said he didn't want the documentation to interfere with the program. He said, get that out of the way. And then after you finish the product, concentrate on just one sprint just to do the you know, help desk, help screens, et cetera, and everything. At the end, See, that's I've... what you release. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Okay. Yeah, since that's what I do for a minute. There's a couple of other documentation that exists in a project. The kind you're talking about, which are the artifacts, to define what needs to be developed. And those need to be maintained throughout the course of all the sprints and updated when they change so that somebody can go back later when the tester comes in and says, well, this doesn't match what the story said. So there's that level of documentation. Then there's all the stuff, depending on what you're producing, that needs to go with the product, as we mentioned here, the online help, perhaps, or a user guide or a release note that's a client-facing document, or a release note, or internal setup instructions, or other kinds of things. It's a whole other level of documentation that seems to get lost in a lot of these things. And I had a struggle and fight to find a place in an agile environment for myself and my team to be relevant and remembered so that when we had to deliver our part of the documentation, a, the resources were still available if we hadn't captured it before the end of the sprints, which happened the first round, because everybody was too busy trying to build something to think about it needs to bring. What do we tell the customer? How do you just So I think that there's two things here, right? I think that's a really, really good point. I think it's important to separate stuff that we use as part of the process for building software and stuff that we actually have to deliver that we're on the hook for, right? And if we're on the hook for delivering help documentation or 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 manuals or run or books, notes, or, run books yeah, or whatever, yeah. like that's actual like that is stuff that we have to have that we have to build. Like there's gonna have to be like if you're using a task board, it's gonna have to be a sticky or an index card on there that says build this thing because we have to deliver it. And is it more important or less important than the code? Doesn't matter. It is no more important or less important. Either if, if we have to deliver it, we have to deliver it. And not delivering it is failing the same way not delivering the code is failing. I think that the intent of this sentence is more around 
de defining the requirements up front. Yeah, it's, about, it's not yeah. about producing things that we deliver. It's about producing comprehensive, the comprehensive part of the comprehensive documentation is, means the stuff that at extra documentation or comprehensive documentation we build as part of the process to build the software, not as an artifact that we deliver. Can I just interject from here? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so when I learned about the Agile Manifesto, I just kind of broke it in as an either or. So, like, um, I was thinking in this kind of binary state, but then I, after reviewing it over and over and over again, I realized that um, there's actually that missing statement that's not at the bottom. Of the part where it says, while we prefer the things on the, on, on the left, we, we, we value the things on the left, we value the things on the right more. Yeah, while, yeah. while there's important the things right, on the right, right value the things so more left. on the left. Yes. Yeah. So um, at the end of the day, you know, you're, we're trying to create software that right. users will use. That's right. Uh, at the end of the day, when I, I as a user go on my like, smartphone and I download an app, I'm playing around with it more than kind of going through the user that. Although that, if that's a requirement for the deliverable, it should be a user story in the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so the user manual, you got functional specs. I mean, you guys have a way of building stuff out of your head. And, you know, it's, well, it's, it's sometimes I, I work with developers. And they're like, you know, they 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 you know don't want to sit in on the functional spec writing, and then they build something that's you know that's not expected. So mm -hmm. I think the business requirements of the functional specs are key documents that guide them in terms of what they're developing. So I'm mostly a developer and a little bit of a scrum master, which I know is a bad idea. But when you're doing things in an agile fashion, there isn't that much of a time of the requirements. We're doing one thing that's on a post-it note, and it's possible to talk about that and have a conversation in a developer's attention span. Yeah, but you have this incorporated in a, in a document, right? Because um, I see the post-it note. Eventually. Notes. Okay. Well, uh, no, some of it is going to be in the integration test so that we have it in executable form that the BAs review. Some of it is going to not be needed. Some of it will be documented. Okay, but so in essence, there's going to be a document somewhere that incorporates all this, right? Well, let's, so before we get down, because this is, why don't we go on, because I think we're going to yeah. talk about Scrum No, no, next. but I, I, I want to have this clarified. Well, okay. so we're, I'm, I'm, I'm telling, let's, let's, if we, I think okay. that, so the reason I want to go to this next slide was because because we're actually talking about the pad, the sort of, this is the daily scrum pattern, and we're talking mm -hmm. about, and so before, you know, and part, before I clarify that, what I want to, um, I would want to make sure we're all talking the same language here, um, because if they, just, to, just to make sure that, uh, that we, don't, we don't lose, so what is scrum? Scrum is an agile methodology, um, which means it is a way of building software that relies on a set of practices. Um, and I'm just gonna read out, because we could summarize it in one slide here, which means it's not particularly complex. You were right. A team lead isn't a isn't a role. Yeah. Sorry. I was wondering who said that. I wasn't going to correct you. <laughs> However, a team lead it might not be a role, but it is absolutely valid a part of a, a typical Scrum team. I mean, it, it could be possibly part of the role because the team member. Well, I mean, it's so this is like this is like the canonical rules, though, and and yeah. and yeah. you're right. I was wrong. Yeah. So there are three main roles on a Scrum project: product owner, Scrum master, and team member. The team, including the product owner and generally including the team lead, because generally a team is going to have a lead, um, maintains a backlog of features and requirements that need to be built, organized by value and difficulty. And that second bullet is, is where, where, where your question um, revolves around, which is why I wanted to get to the slide. Um, the software is built using time boxed iterations called sprints. At the start of each sprint, the team does planning to determine which features from the backlog to build. Every day, the heat team holds a short face-to-face -face meeting called a daily scrum to update each other on the progress they've made in the roadblocks ahead. The scrum master keeps the project rolling by helping the team identify and remove roadblocks. At the end of the sprint, working software is demonstrated, and the team holds a retrospective to figure out the lessons they've learned so they can improve. And this is a little picture we have of it, um, where we have this developed scrum teams will do typically use a 30-day sprint, plenty of use a two-week two sprint or a one-week sprint. Um, and we have to start with a backlog and do planning, and then a daily scrum through development. At the end, sprint review, where you actually show your working software to your users and stakeholders. And then a retrospective just within the team, where you talk about what you learned and what you can change. Um, now, I think it's really, really good and useful for us in this talk that we had, this is such a sort of prototypical discussion. <coughs> 
we've got to have a functional requirement. Like, this is something we could actually have our little developer and project manager uh, cartoons saying to each other. We've got to have a, a, a functional... A new slide is born. Yeah. <laughs> we've got to have functional requirements because, uh, because how else are we going to know what we're going to build and how we know what we're going to be delivering? Well, I think the equivalence of that is your stories, but this has to be captured somewhere. But then there's, well, I'm not even going to look at it. Let's give me some post-its, and we're going to talk about it and have it, you know, i, I got to be honest with you. I'm not even going to read the damn thing, you know. <laughs> Okay. But she reads the post-it, so where is that? So what's the artifacts at the end of the day? And, and more importantly, can't we just have this discussion over and over and over again? And yet, she, one of the things, the, the concept of agile development is not to have a function. The, agile, the idea is to have a, a product owner have some concept of what he, he or she wants to have developed. And that, those stories come out of that in his head, out of those. Well, what's I'm not, that's not, well, hold on. So that's not quite true, right? So, so if you want to go to, first of all, one of the things I really like to refer to is Agile Project Management with Scrum by Ken Schwaber. A, it's a great book. Um, and, you know, they, and I have a huge amount of respect for Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland because they created Scrum and they did a lot of things that aren't immediately, yeah, there's a huge amount of science. The science of Scrum is deep. And even though the rules are simple, it's very quality minded. Which yeah, is very which, and we're quality people, so we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> meaning we like the ideas and things like Not like that Duran, we're quality, quality people, people but, but <laughs> the more like Deming, Duran, Crosby kind of quality stuff is that's our, our, our thing, right? Yeah. Um, and if you look in Agile Project Management Scrum, there's no user stories. Um, user stories are actually something that uh, Mike Cohn, who we love and wrote a great forward for us for Learning Agile. Um, calls GASPs, generally accepted scrum practices. Um, and they're a great practice. But if you look <laughs> in Agile Project Management with Scrum, which was how most people learned about Scrum from the, in the beginning. You can still download like the Scrum the, the Scrum, scrum rule book and it's totally like there's no not only there no they user, don't mention user stories. And the, the requirements that he has in the backlog, it looks like a, these are functional standard functional requirements that are um, you know I learned about Carl, functional requirements from Dean Leffingwell and Carl Wiggers, who Carl wrote a great story from us in Beautiful Teams. He's an awesome guy. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, his book, Software Requirements, is one of the best books on software requirements engineering around. And it is, you know, as much as agile people love to deride waterfall, a lot of great software has been built with functional requirements. But more importantly, functional, like the back, the product backlog in a classic original Scrum pro style Scrum project looked like a functional requirements document. And, and now, that said, the point of it wasn't to document the functional requirements. The point of it is what you were talking about, having a product owner whose job it is to actually understand what the users need and help the team to understand it, not just write them down. Because the point of that functional requirements, again, isn't to document it. It's as a way to, for us to understand what's valuable. The most important thing is that the people on the project understand what they have to do. And I agree with you, there are deliverables that, that come out of that where you need to have documented it for future people who are going to maintain it or for people who are going to support it or, or whatever. But just the process of getting the requirements into the heads of the people who are going to develop it, the goal is to, is to get that understanding however you need to do it, if that's with you know, user stories, if it's with post-it notes, if it's with, you know, reams of paper. Now, it is great if you have a project team where all the developers are happy to read functional requirements documents. Um, now, I have found that, that a lot of functional requirements documents can be heavily stripped down. Um, because, um, and there's, and one of the ideas that, that we, we talk about is you know, the minimal requirement, the minimal documentation needed to actually communicate what's needed. Um, but more important than any of that documentation is making sure that what's in everybody's heads is what's needed to build the software. And the goal also is to make, the reason that you focus on minimal documentation is that you're trying not to make too many decisions up front. You're trying to make the decisions as you have the most information to make the decisions. So. I think that's a good slide. Okay. Slide sure. Um, and and so I think this is this is where it comes to. Um, so some of the things we're talking about is step are stepping back from the practices 
and talking about some of these ideas behind them. So here's this list of practices. Like, you can list out all the practices on like, the core practices of Scrum. Project backlog, sprint, sprint planning, sprint backlog. Um, for those of you who just don't know the term backlog, a backlog is literally just a list of requirements or stories or whatever you're going to be building in, in small units where they're, they're generally as small as you can make them while still delivering some sort of something that's actually valuable. Um, and you'll have a big backlog that the product owner maintains where they're like, these are all the things that we're going to be building in the long run. These are all the things that, that we know about that our users are going to eventually need. And then for the sprint, that one iteration, this next 30 days, they sit down with the team at the beginning of that at sprint planning and say, which of these backlog items are we going to try to build by the end of the sprint? Um, and they have that daily scrum meeting. Uh, they have the task boards and burn down charts, which we talked about. I'm sorry, sorry, just quickly, so in a sprint, is, is just the requirements gathering and development happening in the sprint, is that true? So in a sprint, so the purpose of the sprint is to deliver working software at the end of it, where you're delivering something valuable. Um, so it's a whole cycle of requirements, yes. development, testing, and rollout. Yes, you okay. should. You don't. And you don't. And there's this concept of done, done. You don't deliver it at the end unless it's done, done. Not like done, but we still got to test it. Not done, but there's some other stuff. No, done. Like we could deliver this. Like if you, if you're like, if if we demo this and and. The result of that demo to the users is, um, at that sprint review meeting, um, if the result of that demo is, yes, definitely, roll this out. We can roll this out. And you might need a little sprint to do, like, to, to, be, to, to do things like install scripts and things. But we're actually delivering real working software, and we're demoing it. And that's the purpose of sprint. And we've got these, you've got these you know, additional, you know, you know, additional uh, practices, like user stories and story points and velocity, which we don't have to go into right now. Um, but you've got these roles, the idea of this product owner, this person who's actually able to make decisions about what you are going to be building for the company and understands what's valuable. Isn't backlog, grooming, and estimation missing in the key practice? Well, it's not a practice as much as it's just part like, of sprint planning. Yeah. And, and backlog grooming is something that you do. That's, that's what happens. Backlog grooming is, is something that, that what they call it when you actually go through the backlog um, regularly and, and uh, and figure out is is what's in our long term plan is sort of our split plan is are these actually what so we should be doing? Right? Well yes. that's the product owner. Mm -hmm. Usually the product owner will they, the product owner should be doing that, but they'll 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 learn each other. Sometimes the whole team will take a look at the at, at the backlog together. It's happened. So let me share what we do, right? So yeah. we have a two week sprint. Mm -hmm. uh, for four times in the sprint for like four hour sessions. The product owner will explain what the story is, and then the team will, of course, play the poker game and they'll estimate the story. So he's talking about planning poker, which is the process right. for but estimating. The point is, by the time you come for sprint planning, you have a groomed and an estimated backlog where the team also has an appreciation of what the goal is. So that's a key practice for us. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good practice. We actually write about exactly what you're saying. We it's in, it's in our book, so. It's, it's, it's just not a canonical scrum practice. Yeah, okay. it's generally yeah. not like it's, but it's it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and the reason that the team has to be involved is because like is because is it's really important to know what's hard and what's easy. Developers could say this is too complex. And this yeah. Is easier to develop. And and, and and yeah, and also just but even more than that, getting the developers. You know, part of what the product owner does is he gets the developers to actually care about what the users need, cares about what's valuable to the user, and that's where these ideas, this idea of values. Yep. Yeah, all of these, all of the different kind of agile <coughs> methodologies and schools of thought come with a set of values, each of them. And, and it's interesting because it, any time that I've ever seen presentations about, about you know, Scrum or about XP, or people kind of say, oh, and there are values, and then they kind of move on. You know, and they don't, really, they don't really talk about it that much because it seems like something that's kind of ethereal and difficult to kind of think through. Um, but actually, we focus on the values a lot. And so I'm going to read these off. Um, Scrum comes with five values. Commitment, each person is committed to the project's goals. Respect, team members respect each other. Focus, everyone is focused on the work. Openness, each team member is aware of the work that everyone else is doing. And courage, team members have the courage to stand up for the project. Now it's easy to say, oh, well, commitment, respect, focus, openness, courage. I mean, who could be against those things? Those things are really great things. Well. Turns out it's actually a lot harder to to, uh, to to stick to that stuff. 
than, than it sounds. Um, so that's when you get better than not doing it scrum, right? When you, when you try to put all those practices in place, you focus on each of the practices, you put them in place, and you end up with, these are kind of some, some like distinguishing uh, uh, signs of better than not doing it scrum to us. Which means, like, again, it's still worth doing. You're definitely going through the motions of the scrum project, but it doesn't feel like, it still feels like it's not that different than what you were doing before. Just a little bit better. So we've got command and control project managers maintain the schedule and get status updates from the team. And this idea of command and control project management, where your job as the project manager is to lay out the plan, you know, plan the work and work the plan, and make sure that everybody's following your plan, and you know, put in a change control process so that if the plan needs to change, you could change it. But you know, it's this control, and everybody has a big picture, and we can say, oh yeah, four months from now, this is what we're going to be working on. And that's what this picture is showing. See, the project manager is updating the plan. The people are updating the project manager. And, and they don't have any direct kind of input into this. Team leads assign the work to team members, and the team members do what's required, which I think is exactly what you were talking about. It's always nice when somebody asks a question, and then we have a bullet for it. <laughs> um, but, like, and that's really comfortable, right? This, you know, this idea of, um, you know, this, this idea of, of, of commitment be committed to the goals of the project. That is absolutely the opposite of, I'm not committed to the goals of the project, I'm just committed to doing what you tell me. I don't give a crap about this project goals. And, and that, I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm just focused on my own thing. And that's really, really comfortable. That's a very, very comfortable place for a team to be. Um, requirements come in at the start of the sprint. And any changes are pushed to the next sprint. Yeah, a lot of Scrum teams will use kind of the fact that you have a backlog and that you get user stories and that, you, that you're grooming the backlog as a way of kind of putting a line in the sand and saying we won't make any changes during the current sprint. We'll only make changes during the next sprint, which is in some ways, you know, um, not all about customer collaboration, right? It's, it's more about kind of setting up boundaries, almost like a waterfall project, but because it's so short, it doesn't feel that way. Iterations feel like mini waterfall projects with many of the same pitfalls. So don't talk to me about, I'm only going to commit to what we're delivering at the end of the sprint. Don't talk to me about anything after that. I'm not going to, I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I want to, we've got this thing, we've got our backlog, here's what we're building. We've established a contract for what we're actually going to be building and I don't care if something's more valuable. I don't care if we discover that one of these things we're working on really doesn't make any sense. You know. Maybe we've got a product owner who, who is, they've technically got a product owner, but they need to know, it's really, really common for them not to really have the authority to say yes or no on behalf of the users. So they're just basically sort of hurting the backlog, and then eventually they'll go off to the people who really have the authority to make decisions and come back to us with whatever decision you made on high, and then we'll adjust for them at the end of the sprint or the next sprint. Um, what ends up happening is the whole Scrum adoption somehow feels empty. Like everyone's just going through the required motions, but not really, not much has really changed for the project. And that's, I see them head nodding, and that's, that's really, really familiar. Like, why did we do all this agile stuff? Well, it was better than not doing it. But I read in these books, aston I'm gonna get astonishing results. I'm gonna get hyper-productive teams. Where is that? I, 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 I'm, all I'm seeing is we're a little more efficient, and we had to make a change. And change doesn't come without cost. Um, you know, because I, someone came in here and started training me on Scrum and training me on Agile. And before that happened, I knew when I came, into, came to work today, you know, I would come to work in the morning, I knew what I had to do, I'd go home at night, feel like I had job security, feel I really understood my job, I understood everything I had to deliver, I understood the way everything was going to work. I was moving up in this company. I was getting people respect, who respected me. Things were good. And then this change happened, this agile change. And now I don't like, no one can really tell me what agile even means. What is the scrum stuff? Is it just these practices? Okay, fine, but why are we making this big deal for this tiny little you know, incremental improvement? And in the meantime, suddenly, I don't know that I can do my job. Now I've got this product owners can come in and tell me to make all these changes to what I'm doing. Now I've got to go to all these meetings rather than just hold up in my room and build code. You know, I, I, this is uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable. But the and only thing that, let's, 
we're at the end of our time, I think, and we didn't get through the rest of it. We still got 20 minutes? Okay. So, I think there was a, a nice... <laughs> yeah, what do you want to... If we have 20 minutes, where do you want to go? Well, where, where were we in this scrum? We... we just finished scrum. Well, and so that's it. So, so we were going to talk... So, so the way we've laid this out, we've kind of got this idea of what is XP, what is Lean, what is Kanban. And clearly there is more... And by the way, you guys are guinea picking this for us. Um, one of the reasons we love talking here is because we have always come here with uh, kind of our, our next talk. Um, and sometimes it means that we have a lot more slides we have time for, but also because we get a lot of great questions and nobody just sits there like a lump with a slack jaw and stares at us while we talk. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the things we wanted to get out of this is this idea that, that every one of these methodologies, you know, X, while Scrum is more focused on project management, um, XP tends to be more, is more focused on code and development and architecture. And Lean, Lean is... Um, Why don't we go to the Venn diagram? Yeah. Actually, let's do three types of waste first, because three types of waste are awesome. OK, why not? We love the three types of waste. So um, a lot of people came to Agile not through Scrum, but through Lean. Uh, which Did any of you guys come to Agile through Lean? Um, you guys know Lean? Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah. OK. There you go. So, um, a lot of the ideas behind Lean came out of, um, and especially from Kanban, which is the, a, met a method of, improve, of process improvement that is based on the ideas of Lean, that, that, it, that takes, it comes to the, the values of Lean. Um, a lot of it comes from what happened in Toyota in the 1950s and the Toyota production system, um, <coughs> Deming and, and all that good quality stuff that we, we love. Um, and a lot of what drives that, especially what drove, you know, what happened is in the 50s, um, Toyota came up with some ways to make cars a lot cheaper than American car companies were making. That's the eight-second version of it. <laughs> um, it's uh, a lot of hand-waving there. But one of the important ideas that came out of it was this idea of three types of waste that happen on, um, on you know, well, on, and manufacturing, but also it would be very familiar with anyone building software. Um, Muda, Murda, and Muri. Muda means futility, uselessness, idleness, Super, superfluity, waste, wastage, and wastefulness. Um, futile crap. Stuff that you, sh that, that you just have to do because you're going through the motions because it's required and it's stupid. Um, mura means unevenness, irregularity, lack of uniformity, non-uniformity, inequality, or... Like every software project that you've been on where you, you sit around and wait for the requirements forever and ever and then all of a sudden everything's due the next day and you have to stay for 24 straight hours to get it done, right? Mori means unreasonable, impossible, beyond one's power, too difficult, by force, per force, forcibly, compulsively, excessiveness, and moderation. And it's something that we call magical thinking. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever had a manager with manage yes. magical thinking, but I know I have. Magical thinking is great because with magical thinking, anything is possible. The team can do anything. <laughs> um, and it doesn't matter how much they're doing today. They can do more tomorrow. Um, and yeah, well, it's, you know, I, I, and, and um, just, you know, buckle up and do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, when you think about magical thinking and where it comes from, you, you can get a little bit of sympathy for the manager. Because um, just kind of the way that the programmers say, I don't want to think about what's happening around me. I just want to give me my tasks. I'm going to do them. I'm going to tick off the Jira ticket or whatever, and I'm going to hand it back to you. The, magic, the manager is like, I don't want to think about what your team, this team is doing. I don't, I don't want to know how the sausage is made. I don't really care. I have this magical team where I pile work on them. It gets done like magic. <laughs> um, now, usually he has an accomplice, and that accomplice is the hero programmer. The hero programmer is the guy where everything is a mess on Friday, and he works all weekend to get sleeping, and he comes on a Monday, and it's done. Wow. Um, and usually, he gets a lot of respect, and generally is paid pretty well. And, and you know, with a guy like that, you can generally pile a lot of stuff on the team. And anybody who, who's, who's not working, you know, pulling their weight, well, look at him. He's doing that. And look at him, look how awesome he is. You should do it, too. Um, and he's there to absorb a lot of the magic. 
Um, these guys together, <laughs> and you know, and, and <laughs> it's and what what happens is you get the you know you get you get a system like this, and it's kind of a little feedback loop. Well, I can pile more stuff on as a boss. Well, I'm the hero, and I can be more heroic and get more respect from the people around me, and generally a bigger bonus. So, so the the kind of the point of lean, and, and we won't we won't really touch on this because we don't have a lot of time, but. Um, the, the idea with Lean is that you kind of have these, these thinking tools that help you to find and get rid of these, these waste uh, work, the work that you're doing that is actually wasteful on your project. So here's something. Lean, one important thing about Lean is it's a mindset. And I think that is where we can kind of wrap this up and we can go with this. Um, you said something at the very beginning that I thought was really, really good, which was that um, you can't try to cram a methodology or method in place <coughs> when it clashes with the culture of the company. That is a theme for us throughout our book, throughout our, our, our work lives that we've been dealing with for a long, long time. And, um, and when you say cultural company, that's kind of hard to, um, it's not very specific in a lot of ways, but mindset is more specific. And generally, like when you have those scrum values of focus, where, you know, we're meaning you don't multitask, and openness, which means if something's bad, you're going to tell everybody and not try to hide it, and courage and respect. You, you get um, the mindset that you need for Scrum is a mindset where all those things are good, and, and those, those things are accepted. Um, and when, and if, so if you've got a mindset where, no, I can multitask, just pile it on me, I'm the hero and I can do it, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really mesh with openness or focus. That means, you, you know, and if you've got an organization where, you've got a boss with magical thinking, and teams are expected to just do, it doesn't matter what's in your backlog, it doesn't matter what's on your task board, it doesn't matter what you agree to in a sprint plan, we have this thing, we need to do it now, and you throw it all out, and if that's okay, it's gonna be really, really hard to adopt Scrum effectively. And you're gonna be able to put the practices in place, but it's gonna feel empty, and it's gonna feel better than not doing it. Because you got a company where the values of the company don't mesh with the values of the methodology. Lean is a name for a mindset. The lean mindset has these values, eliminate waste, amplify learning, which is basically about iteration and feedback loops. Decide as late as possible. We're talking about minimal documentation and also making decisions in the project as late as possible. And one of the things we didn't get to cover with XP is how that applies to architecture, which I know there was a question. It actually does work. Empower the team. Um, deliver as fast as possible, which doesn't mean Break your, you know, doesn't mean throw out all the, you know, everything that's good and just get something out of the door. It means, well, it's got a lot of things. <laughs> um, build integrity in and see the whole. Deliver as fast as possible is about like building a machine that builds that 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 works to its best ability, right? Like your team like takes uh, Thank you. needs yeah. in and. At the end of it, there's software. And the idea is that you're constantly, if you think about the way that you work, the process that you're following as a, as a process, that you are constantly keeping track of how well it's doing and trying to make sure that there's good flow through it and not so much waste clogging stuff up. Um, thinking about it in that way can cause you to make different and better decisions than you do if you think about it as a series of practices stacked on top of each other. So a company that really, um, an interesting thing happened when Toyota took their Toyota production system and started just kicking ass in the auto market. A lot of Detroit tried to do the same thing and for about 20 years just failed miserably. They've gotten pretty good at it in the last couple of decades. But um, the problem was, and, and they would look at it and say, we're doing the same thing they're doing. They had these little Kanban cards they used to keep track of their parts inventories. They had just-in-time delivery of parts. We're doing the same thing. Why, why, aren't we, why aren't we getting the same results that they are? And it's exactly the same thing as with, say, Scrum. We're doing the same thing. We're doing the same practices. We're having our daily stand-ups. We're having, we're having our sprint planning game. We're having our sprint review. We're grooming our backlog. We're using user stories. We're doing burn-down charts and task boards and velocity and planning poker and, you know, and I can tick them all the stuff off on a list. Why does it just not feel like we're doing all that much more than we were before? So I want to go over this slide. Can you do better than not doing it? Better than better not than not doing it results. 
That's a tongue twister. Yeah, we, this is the end. Um, so, I mean, and, and the kind of four things that we think help you to actually get the most out of kind of putting agile practices in place um, and agile kind of thinking in place where you are um, is choosing a methodology with values that match your team and company culture and practices that address real problems. Just coming in with a book and saying, okay, tomorrow we're all going to do Scrum can, can be a, a, a very bad thing to do uh, at, at a place that's not ready for it and that doesn't see the value in it, right? If, if you're working in a place where mistakes can cost you your job, or at least cost you the respect of the people around you, if you're working and it's a place where you have to be able to point to, like if something goes wrong, you have to be able to point to a spec that has all the things you were going to code in it, or a Jira ticket. Or, 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 or something, you know, an email from a user that says, well, you had to do, we're supposed to deliver this. And there's always some way you can back it up because if something goes wrong, someone else, that, that has to rain down on someone other than you if you want to keep your job tomorrow. Then maybe waterfall is really the right, might be the best thing you can, that's probably the best you can do. Um, because it makes sure you have all that CYA in place. And it makes sure that if there's changes, there's a change control process so that you don't run around like chicken with chickens with their heads cut off. Anytime there is a change, you actually have a process you can follow and still meet the needs of your users. There are many paths to becoming agile, but there's no single universal agile, and agile implementation that you can simply follow. Not even Scrum. Because even though it's simple, there's a lot to it. And it's really, really easy to cut the legs out from under it. And do everything except for that one important thing that really makes it work, and then you end up just going through the motion. You know? And for example, having your daily scrum meeting, that's really just a status meeting. And having a scrum man and master who's really a project manager and just handing out tasks. Start with the practices because they are a great way to learn a new way of thinking. But but because a great way to a great way to learn a new way of thinking is to start acting differently. So that's the thing. The practices are not an end unto themselves. You're not doing Scrum with all of its intents if you're just ticking the box on, all, on the checklist of practices. So what, what we're saying here is that you can just tick the box on the, on the practices, but don't think that you're getting everything out of it by doing that. You'll get better than not doing it results, which yeah. means it's worth doing. You know? And it's the way you start. You start by putting the practices in place, and then you learn the value that they can bring. And then you slowly get people around you to start to understand the principles behind what you're doing. You know, I, I did a, um, a pretty typical certified Scrum Master course as part of the research for this book, just because I wanted to see what are they teaching people. There's good stuff there. We have a whole book on, PN, on PMP certification, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. I think we're, I'm proud of that book, and I think that if you do all the stuff in it, your project's going to go pretty well. Um, but that's mainly focused around tools, techniques, and practices. Um, that's a good, act, a good way to get to the right mindset is to start acting like people have that right mindset. Just recognize that you're mainly just going to get the better than not doing the benefits of those practices. And finally, a practice that works really well for one team can utterly fail for another because they have a different attitude and a different mindset. And that's, that's really important. It's important to recognize that failure is an option. It's important to recognize that if you're in a company where the culture is, we have to have a spec. We all have to agree on it. This is, we will, before we start any work, we all have to, like, it's not about the spec. It's about all of us seeing it and having, feeling comfortable that we all signed off on it. And that, that somebody with some expertise actually looked at it. And that we aren't going to make a mistake with this thing. Trying to put in place a self-organizing team where you make decisions late, as late as possible and you, don't, you actually leave a lot of that stuff unwritten so you don't tie yourself down to decisions that you could make better later because you have more information, which is a great idea and we thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> if you're at a company where the culture doesn't support it, you're going to not just fail, but you might lose your damn job. Don't do that. Don't lose your job over this. Um, but if you can find a way to bring some of the practices in and help people see, you know, there's value in this, we're making improvements, but you know what? If you start thinking a little bit differently, maybe we can actually see some real improvements. That's a, that's a big thing, and that, that, that's where you can actually see some, 
some real, real value in this, this whole pile of stuff that we call Agile. Okay, I think that I think that's the whole thing, Richard. Does Does anyone have any kind of final questions or any any final thoughts that they want to bring up? We've, we've got five minutes left. I have a question. You had project backlog. Yes. How different is project backlog or product backlog? Hmm. I think that those are pretty much synonymous. Um, At least the way we wrote them. Yeah. yeah, and we might have actually written project backlog and meant product backlog. Um, it actually gets to, you know, something bigger than that. Um, <coughs> when you have been doing this for a really long time and done what, like, we have an interesting kind of unique perspective because we've spent the last 10 plus years talking to as many people as possible, interviewing people from CTOs of giant companies to developers on tiny little teams and, and hundreds of interviews, hundreds of, you know, talking to so many people. Um, we have a whole book of interviews and stories from people. Um, and that's just a fraction of what we're talking about. Um, you start to, um, you, some of these things start to blend together a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, you, and, and it's actually a good thing. Um, one, of the, one of the concepts of Agile, it's actually, we talk about it in, in our, um, the end of our book, is something that's lifted from martial arts called Shuhari. Um, and it's a way of learning. It's, 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 from, it's actually from a martial art I study, Aikido. Um, and the idea is there's this, this three levels that, that, that this applies to learning lots of different, lots of different things. Shu, um, and by the way, um, Alistair Coburn um, is the guy who actually really popularized this for software, and he is awesome. If you have, get a chance to read Agile, so Agile um, little Software Development, the cooperative game, it's a fantastic book. We refer to it a lot, and we, we recommend it in, in learning Agile. Um, Shu means rules. You know, when I'm training a team for the first time in English studies, and this is actually something that I have seen myself, and this is something that he points out, um, they'll say, well, should we write it on index cards or post-it notes? Like, I don't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. Like, I know, because I know for sure. Or Jira tickets. Yeah, Jira or, tickets. Or paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, or is, should they be, you know, should things just be in a document somewhere? They don't know that it's not important. They don't know what's critical and what's something that can be changed at any time. So you have to give them a rule. And eventually, they see enough rules, and they eventually they get to this ha level, where they've kind of transcended to this idea this, that, that, OK, I started to see the system. These aren't just individual rules that I follow. There's a system that, that, that's in place. Um, now eventually, um, once you start seeing not just the system, but another system, then you get another system, um, the systems start to fade away. And then you kind of you get to a point of point when we're working on a software project together, which has been a while, but it's kind of like we don't really follow a lot of rules. We just do whatever is the right thing to do right now. Which is actually the team I'm on right now works that way and it's awesome because these are guys I've been working with for oh, the better part of the decade and just we don't have to write things down unless we do and then we do it. Um, and um, and that's that's, that's the B. That's where where there aren't, you know, there's and, and the one thing that Coburn points out is it's when you hear somebody on a re mindset talking to somebody, you know, when you're at a shoe or a high level mindset, it sounds like he calls distress, says distressingly zen. Like, do it unless you don't need to. Do what you need to do right now. And that, like, that's, that's crazy, but it's, it's the way it really, you know, and so, like, project backlog versus product backlog, I, I forget. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're looking, I know we did a whole lot of technical review and a lot of checking to make sure that our book is correct. I'm pretty sure Our we're still project backlog's not in the index. Yeah, the okay. Thanks, Gene. Thank <laughs> um, so with that, um, distressing. Slide was note. wrong in two two counts. No. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna turn it over to Richard. Um, thanks, guys. I hope this was helpful. I hope you liked it. Um, thanks. Mm -hmm.